every single day, let us never forget what Christ has done for us. We were praying this morning as a team, and I just sensed in my heart that it, it, it can be easy for us to get used to the resurrection message, the good news that this is what Jesus has done for us and we're thankful for it. And I'm not saying necessarily that we choose to take it for granted, but it is easy for us if we're not mindful daily, moment by moment, to be in awe of who God is, what he has done, what he is still doing on the inside of our hearts and our lives day in and day out. The message I have for you today is a very straightforward one, very simple, a reminder of God's faithfulness to us. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said... Let there be light, and there was light. Bring us all the way back to the very forming of what we understand as reality of the world that we're in. When God created this at the very onset, it says there that the earth was without form and void. I can't even begin to wrap my mind around what that means. The Hebrew writers and scholars understand the word without form as tohu means formless and void wabohu is void. So tohu wabohu, formless and void. My mind is not able to imagine a moment or an environment where there was something but nothing at the exact same time where there was God and there was the earth and the heavens, but and yet it was still formless and void. Other meanings of these two words together mean laid to waste, confusion, emptiness, vanity, nothing, tohu wa bohu. Now, there are good things in our life that are are formless, that are chaotic, that are kind of scattered all over the place. There are good things in our lives, such as the clouds in the sky, beautiful paintings from master artists, the game that we all probably played growing up, Duck, Duck, Goose. You guys remember that game? The chaoticness of, am I going to be picked or not? Is he going to run past me or not? We played that a few weeks ago in youth group, and I would like to say that I won, but I got owned. So duck, duck, goose, random, 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 go, right? Some random things are actually good. For me, one of the things that I do anytime that I go to a coffee house or oftentimes when I go to a restaurant is I will ask them, I'll just say, give me dealer's choice. Now, that might mean something different for you, but for me, what that means is I am placing my trust in your hand server, and I'm trusting that you will give me something good, an incredible drink or something that's, you know, maybe not on the menu, but it's everyone's favorite. Yeah, it's a little bit chaotic to do that. You have to kind of hold your breath waiting for the first sip or the the first plate. When the plate comes out to hopefully they gave you something that's good. It's kind of a wild way to live your life as well, at least as wild as I'm going to get. And so, I don't know, I mean, I guess jumping out of an airplane parachuting is probably a little more wild, but right, some of those things. Uh, But for those of you like, I'm not really wanting to do action sports ever again or to begin with, maybe dealer's choice is your next random, chaotic, formless, kind of void action that you can take. It's it's putting your hands in somebody else's, or your life in somebody else's hands. But our God, he created everything out of nothing, just with his words that he spoke. With, With one word, let there be light, what was up to that point, formless and void, tohu wabohu, at that point, light scattered. And we now know As God stretched out the heavens and he made the galaxies and placed the stars and he began to shed light all the way throughout, we now know, scientists are telling us, that actually the universe is continuing to expand. I don't know how we know that. I don't know what kind of microscopes tell us that. But they're they're seeing that literally the words of God, let there be light, is continuing to move out. So we live under this reality of a God that said in the tohu wabohu, the formlessness and void of life, I create just with my words. I create the animals and the vegetation and and the little creepy crawly things and eventually human beings. Everything that we 
experience as human beings, God spoke into existence out of nothing. It doesn't make sense to me. How can you have something from nothing? How can you have order from chaos? I, I don't understand how that is. It's a mystery. Anybody would say that they have it figured out has God too small in their own eyes and their own understanding. This is one of those things we will be, if you're a follower of Jesus, we will be worshiping Jesus and God for the rest of our lives, for the rest of eternity, still in awe of the very first three verses that we read uh, in the book of Genesis, let alone the rest of what God has shared with us. In the beginning, God created the heavens, and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, just brooding over the face of the waters, waiting for that perfect moment to say, let there be light. And from that light came life and existence for all humanity, all of the entire world and everything that we see and experience. I, nowadays, they have uh, apps and then websites you can go to that you can type in whatever words you want, and AI, artificial intelligence, will create an image, which to me is terrifying and cool at the exact same time, that there's computers that are creating art and design, and, and who knows where that's going. Let's, let's hope that goes in the right direction. I have a friend, by the way, who uh, talks very nicely to Siri um, at the end of every conversation. Thank you so much. You're wonderful. I love you. You're kind. Like, really kind. I was like, why do you do that? Because when Siri takes over and AI is everything, <laughs> when they come into their kingdom, they will remember who is good to them. And I am terrible to Siri. <laughs> What's wrong with you? It's not that hard, right? So AI can create art. And so I typed in, I actually had to go to several different websites just to find anything that was remotely usable. And I found this image uh, when I typed in the word formless and void. And here's this picture right here. And it shows up here. It looks honestly really weird to me. I began to read the comments. And again, this was generated by computers. And the comments actually came up with this scripture. It said the whole scripture, and then uh, that was the post of it, but the comments below were <laughs> hilarious. First person was like, the uh, AI doesn't know the Bible. The next person's like, maybe it's learning the Bible, right? Like, and it just starts going on through. And then one person's like, just so you know, Jesus is the white guy with the olive skin uh, in the corner over there. It just, it was funny to listen to how people were reacting to this uh, weirdly formed art uh, that a computer made. And, and literally to type in formless and void, the best I can think of is just black nothingness. It's just empty. But there was still something there. Even AI cannot wrap its mechanical, electronical mind around formless and void. It has to produce something because it can't understand nothing. And so this is that art, this is the picture that came up. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God, our master craftsman, formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. So God formed all things, but specifically crafted human beings to be in the likeness and the image of God, to be image bearers to the world around us, to subdue the world, to be fruitful and to multiply, and to always shine the glory of God into those that would see it. So this is the beauty. This is the created order, the master craftsman with his design. This is what God provided. And yet, in very short order, in very quick amount of time, Adam and Eve, they sinned. They, in all the blessings that God gave them, God asked for one thing that they would not do, and they did it. Isn't that how it always goes? We've been given so much blessed, mercy of God, kindness of God, and yet we always want to be that little, that little rebel side of us wants to do the one or a few things that we're not supposed to do. But in that sin, mankind was from one moment in the beauty and the majesty 
was thrust into utter chaos. In fact, other Hebrew scholars say tohu wabohu is not formless and void. It means more chaos than it means nothingness. So whether it be formless and void or chaos, what mankind was thrust into because of Adam and Eve's sin was chaos. There's another image that I, I typed in. This one I feel like probably got a little bit closer an image of chaos. A lot of them are actually pretty terrifying when I put it in. You can see in the background human beings walking around, and it's just, it's in focus and out of focus, and there's, it's just, it's fearful. Chaos in our lives is not just this ethereal idea from back at the beginning of creation. We experience chaos all the time in our lives. We experience of oftentimes our own doing or of the sin's to others, to us, we experience the brokenness, the chaos, the fear, the anxiety, the ugliness of sin and what it means to be away from the heart of the Father. God wants us to be drawn to him, to live our lives in the direction of relationship, and yet oftentimes we choose to either fully turn our back or to be so distracted, so consumed with worship of other things or of other people that our life gets off track. And no longer is it about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's about ourselves, what we want, what others want for us, and it's about obtaining whatever we can get here on this earth. That causes us and throws us into chaos, not order. And oftentimes that chaos in our hearts carve out a chunk of our hearts and it leaves us formless and void. It leaves an emptiness in our hearts. Chaos causes emptiness. Emptiness causes chaos. It goes back and forth. Jesus is the only one that can heal and can set free. I want to read to you Romans chapter 1, all, not all of it, a portion of it, beginning in verse 21. It says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creepy things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie." And worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what, not, what ought not be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil and covetousness and malice. They are all full of envy and murder and strife and deceit. And maliceness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decrees that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This lays out the progression of lawlessness in our hearts. This spells it out. And while every one of us in here may not have done every single one of those things, this is what it looks like for mankind to be left to our own and to go in the direction that seems right for us. We did not seem fit to acknowledge God says there that we became inventors of evil. We have come up with some creative ways to rebel against God over the years. And this scripture is, I'm thankful, does not leave us in hopelessness, but it does spell a picture in many regards of the chaos and the tohu wabohu that we allow ourselves to walk in even if we are saved. 
And I'm so thankful for the reality that if I put my hope and my trust in Jesus Christ, that I am saved. You are saved. And that we're on our way to heaven. Our sins have been forgiven. And we will spend the rest of eternity in the very real place called heaven, which is in the presence of the Lord. This is a reality that God has blessed us with, that we hold on to, that we do not let go of. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. But in that, just like Adam and Eve, we can consciously, and in, in, in ways that we would never admit, never even dream of, and yet it happens, subconsciously we allow chaos and invite it back into our lives. Most of us would never read that list and, and say, this is what I want, and this is where I want my life to be. We wouldn't want that. But yet, if we don't keep our eyes fixed on the Lord, we don't remain humble, we don't say, God, you deserve all and everything always. Slowly but surely, what happens is the lights begin to go out, and the formlessness and the chaos and the void begin to take back over. Even though we're saved, even though God loves us, we begin to invite what God never designed for us to live in into our lives. Out of the formlessness, out of the void, God caused something beautiful and near immediately mankind threw it away. And that has been the story of mankind since that very moment. God blessing us, healing us, forgiving us, changing our lives, bringing hope to where there's hopelessness and mankind, receiving it with joy oftentimes, but then allowing our hearts to slip far from God because we get lazy, we get distracted, we have better other priorities. It happens over and over and over and again, generation after generation after generation. It's a story, if you will, as old as time. God knows the, the fragileness of our hearts. He knows how, our, how as sinners now, our natural state is that formlessness and void. John chapter 14, verse 4 through 6. This is Jesus telling his disciples that he was going to prepare a place. And so he's surrounded by his followers, and they don't understand what's about ready to take place. They don't understand that the cross is going to happen and salvation is going to come through Jesus. They just know that they love Jesus, and Jesus is saying that he's going away. For all they know, he's going on vacation. He's going somewhere they just don't know about. And so he says, hey, listen, I'm going to prepare a place. In other words, God is saying, I'm getting ready to leave this earth. I'm going to be crucified, murdered. I'm going to be mocked and spit upon, rejected. I'm going to be murdered on a cross. And in all of this, I'm going to die. And then three days later, be raised from the dead. That's him preparing the place for us. But don't worry, he's coming back. That was the blessing. That was the promise. I'm going to prepare a way. And this is how they responded. J Jesus said this, and you... No, the way to where I'm going. So he's saying, even he's been with these disciples for three years, most of them. He's saying, you guys know where I'm going, but they weren't picking up on all of the signs. They weren't, they weren't grasping what Jesus had been speaking of the entire time. They still thought it was all about an earthly kingdom, not something spiritual. You know where I'm going. Then Thomas, we know him as Doubting Thomas, said this to him. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Very naturally. God, I don't know where you're going. I don't know. Is this a, are you are going on a business trip? How long are you going to be gone? What does this look like? Are we still a team? Do you still like us? Are we still a part of the, the crew? What does this look like? Thomas is just like all of us. We just, we want to know the details. Some of you in here, you have been waiting to fully engage and give your heart to the Lord for all of your answers to be, all of your questions to be answered. I need to understand creation. You know, where's the dinosaurs falling with that? And I need to understand all the things about forgiveness, who's really forgiven, who's not. And I need to understand all end time prophecy. I need to understand what's the difference between this and, and Islam and other religions. I need to understand, like, it, I, I need to know. Doubting Thomas, I need to know. I don't know where you're going. I need details. Send me the itinerary. I don't know what's going on. And this is what Jesus said. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
powerful, beautiful, and yet kind of frustrating because, again, Thomas wants to know, I want a location, time, when will you come back? I'm sure all the disciples wanted to know that, hey, you're preparing a place. What does that look like? You know, do I get the nicest room? You know, do I get the upgraded suite? What, I mean, what are we talking about here? Is this Cancun? Where are we going? And Jesus says, actually, I'm not going to answer any of your questions. I'm not going to give the details that sometimes become idols to us. I will fully worship God when I understand God. You'll never be able to understand God. If you understand God and you understand everything that's in his word, I'm telling you, you have shrunk God down too small. And that God that you're serving is not the true living king. And so Jesus said, hey, I'm not going to give you those details. I am telling you that I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There wasn't a lot of extra details that Jesus gave. It was pretty short and to the point. And yet some of the most profound truths are found right there. Can you get to God and salvation in heaven in any other way, any other religion, any other, any, anything like that? Absolutely not. Jesus made it clear right there, no one, no one gets to the Father but except through me. Jesus is the way. He's not a way. He's the way. Jesus is the truth, not a truth. And he is life, not a version of life, one that you can subscribe to or not. You either actively choose to follow Jesus or even if you didn't realize this, you are choosing not to follow after Jesus. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, which means there is no other way of living. There's no undiscovered truth, no better religious system, no majestic person to follow, no mountain to be conquered, no possession to be gained, no mystic power to worship or state of being that will lead you to eternal life. It is only Jesus. This is a harsh, difficult truth for us to wrestle with because that means every other truth that's out there that people follow after, if you're a true Christian, a true follower of Jesus, you believe, even if you don't fully understand, you believe that any other way, truth, and version of life leads to, leads to destruction and not to heaven. We have to believe that. We, Jesus and Christianity and following the Lord cannot be a good option, an acceptable journey to be on. You either believe it and are all in with it, or it is not real to you. And this is something that must be weighed in our hearts. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That means you will never be good enough to save yourself. You will never have all of the details that you need to make decisions that are going to save you from an eternity separated from, from God, which is called hell which is torment, which is the place that has been designed, created for Satan and his demons. You will never be able to somehow get there. It is only through Jesus Christ. Consider the transformative power of Christ Jesus. He brings us from death to life, from ashes to beauty, from orphans to adopted sons and daughters, from disease to healed, from slave to free, from wandering aimlessly to purpose filled, from hopelessness to being confident in the Lord, from defeated to being victorious. We need to stop guessing. We need to stop asking the wrong questions in our hearts and stop living out of those wrong questions like Thomas did. Give me the details. I need to know what to do. And Jesus is saying, this is not about your next step. This is about you and me and our relationship. And the same thing is true 2,000 years ago is true today. Where are you with your relationship with Jesus Christ? Notice, I did not say, where are you with your church attendance? I believe with all of my heart that if you are going to be a, a, a follower of Jesus and you're going to grow and thrive and you're going to be a blessing to other people and you yourself are going to be blessed, you must be a part, an active part of a local church, not just regular Sunday morning attendance, but be a part of what's going on. I believe it in all my heart. Can you be saved and not go to church? Absolutely. Or go to church a few times a year? Sure. 
But the great things that God has for you, you're going to be missing. But I did not say, where are you at with your church attendance? Where are you at with your giving, your serving, your nice words that you post online? Although all those things are important, all those things are a representation of our heart and our true pursuit of God. They, are, they matter, but what matters most is your authentic relationship with Jesus Christ. Where are you with that? Is it stagnant, non-existent? Is it growing? Is it thriving? God never demands perfection. One, because we can't give it to him. God just wants you. Thomas, I'm the way. I want you to be with me. I'm the truth. Just look to me. If you listen to my voice, my sheep know my voice. If you listen to me, I'll give you truth. You want life? Thomas, I'll give you life. But if you pursue ways and truth and life outside of Jesus, you're going to miss Jesus and you're going to miss all of those as well. Seek first the kingdom of God. In other words, run after Jesus. Seek first him and then all of those things, which are good things, they will be added to us. Amen? If we make Christ the first and the center of our life, the priority of our life, we will be blessed with all the things that he shares in his word. But if we run after them, if we run after those things without Jesus, we're going to miss all of it. Stop searching. Stop wondering. Stop trying to figure it out. Jesus is the one that you're looking for. From tohu wa bohu, formlessness and void. A blank, dark canvas of our lives, of our souls. This is, before the painting began, this is what our hearts look like without Jesus. Even if we're saved, but we don't have that relationship, our, our, we have the blessing of salvation, but we have the brokenness and the lights going dimmer and dimmer and dimmer without him. This is not about how much you can get away with or how little you can do to still be a part of the kingdom of heaven. This is about running after Jesus, the one true way and life that we follow after, the truth of God, Jesus, the word made flesh. Stop guessing, look to Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12, verse two, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame he, as he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. A new, uh, it says here, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Do you know what that speaks of? When Jesus went to prepare a place, and in those three days of silence, of in really tohu wa bohu, Jesus is dead. He's in the grave. His disciples are scattered and they're fearful and they don't know what's going on. In those moments of silence from the grave to the point of resurrection, Jesus is doing warfare on your behalf. And he was preparing a place and he was taking back the keys of death and of hell and of sin. And he's saying the victory belongs to me. And so when, from that moment forward, when we, when we as human beings placed our trust in Jesus, from that moment forward, he made us a new creation. Again, once again, from the very beginning of the creation, he spoke and there was, there was life and light. And then because we threw it away, Jesus had to make something, a new way for us, which was himself. He made us a brand new creation. He's still He is still the master craftsman making you and me a masterpiece. I don't feel that way. I mean, I know all, I think I know all of my my issues and my brokenness, and I don't certainly don't feel like a masterpiece, but what is art worth? It's worth what everyone will pay, what anybody will pay for it. If I were to make art, you know, spit it out, $5 maybe, right? Like it's worth whatever someone's willing to pay for it. But you have someone who's a true, genuine artist that paints from a deeper place, and you look at that, and what was formed, you look at it and go, that, that's worth something. It's technically just canvas and paint and 
some wood that holds it all together. But when in the hands of an artist, it becomes valuable. And if I'm telling you this, if you feel like I am worthless, I'm such a failure, I have messed up so much, there's no way that God is able to redeem and set free and fix what I have completely messed up. I'm just like Adam and Eve. I I invited chaos into my life. I do it on a regular basis. I am telling you something you must hear. The way God sees you is priceless. Art is only worth what someone's willing to pay. Jesus looked at you long before you were ever formed in your mother's womb. Jesus looked at you and said, you are worth my life. God himself said, you are worth were worth his life. All the embarrassment, the pain, the excruciating punishment that he went through, he did it because he said, I lost my, the art, the beauty that I created. That my, my image bearers threw it all away, but I'm buying them back. And I'm paying the highest price I possibly can. I'm giving myself because I'm not willing to let my beautiful creation go down the toilet because of the sins of their own doing. I am paying a ransom to get them back. Jesus had to go through the ultimate punishment, which is being separated for the first time in existence as a faithful servant, a suffering servant, Jesus had to go through the separation of being in the presence of God for those days. Formlessness and void. Tohu wabohu. We are his masterpiece. Whether you see yourself that way or not. But how sad is it for us to be paid for by such a high price and to still choose to live for our own? And I can't imagine any of you in here actively, violently opposing God or, or hating him, you're here on Easter Sunday. Even if mom <laughs> twisted your arm and forced you to come, and there's a few of you in here, you're here because mom and dad wanted you here. <laughs> Don't just nod up and down quietly and quickly. I know, it's okay. I can't imagine you rebelling, fully rebelling against God, and yet all of us, including myself, on a regular basis, we have little micro decisions Lord, do you have my my time, my money, my giftings, my attention, my purity? Do you have my imagination? Do you have my hobbies? Over and over and over again, we choose either to follow Jesus or to reject Jesus. Either to run after the one that brings order and beauty and value and worth or to run away towards chaos and emptiness, and the void of living life without a deep, deepening relationship with Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we, have, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance that which is set before us. This is what God's saying. Like, to Listen, those of you that are already saved, we have been set free. Amen. We have been forgiven of so much. It says here again, therefore, because of what, we, what God has done for us and because we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, every single believer that has gone on before us, that we may not have met and known their names, but one day in heaven we will. Every single one that has gone on before us, loved ones and complete strangers, they they are looking on from heaven, cheering you and I on. Because we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This was written to followers of Jesus, to Christians, not to unbelievers, but to those that already say, Jesus, you are my Lord and my Savior. One of the saddest, most broken things in the Christianity today, especially in America, 
is this idea that you can follow Jesus with no sacrifice. Now, to be clear, the gift of salvation is a free gift. It's a grace gift from God. Knowing that we could not pay for it on our own, God had to give himself. He said, all I ask of you is that you would believe in me and that you would put your trust in me and follow me as your Lord and your Savior. So it's a free gift. But it's a free gift that should cost you everything. That gift is given to you. Right now, if I were to imagine if you didn't have a vehicle and I came to you and I said, here is the keys to a brand new SUV. It's a gift. You can't afford it. I'm giving you this gift. I'm not, by the way. So just, just I want to clarify that. Just going to let everybody down here all at the same time. But if I were to give you the keys to a brand new SUV, and I'd say, this is yours. But here's what I expect. You can ignore me. You can do it. It's still yours. The gift is still yours. But there are people in your neighborhood that don't have a vehicle and they don't have the ability to get to the grocery store or to the bank. And, you know, some of them have doctor's appointments. And would you, every once in a while, would you consider driving them, blessing them, taking care of them? Again, it's your gift. Take the keys. You, you could take the gift and I'd never see you again on that. And I, like, that's your prerogative. It's a free gift. But if you're a believer who receives the free gift of salvation because of that free gift, it should change who you are and it should change how you interact with those around you. You should become a blessing. You don't have to to still have the free gift. But why not? You couldn't afford that. It was given to you. And you have people around you that are in desperate need. Why wouldn't you help them? Same thing's true with our salvation. God does not demand you to perform so that you can become saved. But because you are saved, and the great cloud of witnesses and the people that are cheering you on, and the word of God that's written on your heart because of that, Let us choose to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Some of us, we are so busy, so distracted, so much, we are consumers of everything around us, whether it be good things or bad things. We go, I don't have time for church. I don't have time for God. I don't have time for devotions or worship or prayer. I just can't. What you're saying is this. Thank you for the keys. I never want to talk to you again. I don't know about you, but if someone gave me that nice of a gift, I'd be every once in a while at least calling them up and saying, thank you. Do you want to take a ride together? Let me tell you what's been going on, how I've been able to help people around me. I would, I, I would look at that and I would be so thankful that I would want to, to continue to develop that relationship. So we need to lay aside all the sins, all the things that weigh us down, all the things that pull us away from Jesus and our full attention towards him. I hope none of us in here today are in the punch the clock mentality of today. I did my duty. I got God off my back. God doesn't want you to get him off his back. God wants you. Thomas, I'm the way. Me, look at me. I'm the truth. I'm the light. Out of nothing, I created everything. Out of your formlessness and void out of your chaos. I, cr- I created not only everything that you see, but I created a masterpiece, which is you, paid for with my life. And I believe God's saying the exact same thing to all of us here. Whatever your name is, fill in the blank, look to me. I'm your way, I'm your truth, I'm your life. With every eye closed, I want to ask this important question. This question is for those of you that are already followers of Jesus, which means you are already saved and on your way to heaven. And maybe you're in here and you're like, honestly, this resonates with my heart. I know that I have not been doing what Hebrews said, which is to cast aside every single sin that ensnares me and weighs me down. I I have allowed my heart to continue to move back into the place of formlessness, of void, of chaos, of tohu wabohu. I have allowed that to happen. Or in other words, I've not been living my life the way I should towards Christ. 
I know he's not mad. I know that he loves me. I know that there's nothing I could do that could make him love me any more or any less. But I want to know him more. I want to submit to him more. I want to recommit my heart back to him with no one looking around, every eye closed. Just as a sign of acknowledging that so that I can pray over you. If that's you, would you raise your hand and just keep your hand raised? Hands all over the room. God bless you. You put your hands down. Lord, I pray for every person that lifted their hands. Lord, you knew them. God, before time, before they were ever knit together in their mother's room, in the formless void places of their creation, God, you knew them. And you knew we'd be at this moment right here, a room full of broken people that have been saved and set free. And so, Lord, I ask that you would abundantly bless these people who have raised their hand, who have acknowledged. It takes, takes courage to acknowledge that I've gotten off course. And so, Lord, would you bless them? Holy Spirit, would you speak to them? Would you reveal to them exactly in their life what needs to change? Not out of performance, but so that there is not a chasm between you and them. So that they can hear your voice clearer than ever before. So that they can, they can run after you closer than ever before. They can experience your mercy, your grace, and your presence in new and beautiful ways. And Lord, that they would not hold on to their excuses. They would not fight for their, fiercely fight for their independence, but they would over again, they would surrender their hearts to you. That in brand new way, with a new level of commitment, you once again will be the Lord of their life. The one that they submit to. The one that they follow after. God, by faith, we thank you for this, we ask you for this, and we choose to believe that in this moment, every bit of sin that they raise their hand to, the known and the unknown, Lord, that they are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's no question mark there. It's clear. You will be saved. Just a moment longer. For those of you in this room that you would say, honestly, I don't know if I'm saved. I don't have that confidence. Or I know I'm not. I've never made that decision. I, don't, I didn't believe that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And I didn't make a decision to say, you're my Lord. If that's you, but you want to, praise God. I'm going to ask for that in a moment because I want to pray with you. But let me remind you that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it's tell, we're told that God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. This is, that, this is that Thomas thing. God, I gotta know all the details before I say yes. And God say, no, actually, you need to take a leap of faith. You will not hear all the things that you need to hear. You will not know the full way and the truth and the life until you put your full trust in me. You don't get it first and then put your trust in me. It is an act of faith. You act upon what you know and trust God for the rest. The foolishness of this world. It says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 2 through 4, and calling to him the children he put in their midst of them. He put the children in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus is saying is this, you have to act like a child when it comes to these things. You have to say, what do children do? If you're, if you're a parent and you tell your kids, this is what it is even if you don't know what it is. They go, okay, I believe that. Now, God's so much better. He actually knows all the answers. And he knows all the truth. And so when God says, if you will believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, that's a miracle. That's the Savior part. And speak with your mouth that he's Lord. If you'll do that like a child, you'll just believe it because God says it. Then you will be saved. So some of you, you, this is a call for you to once again believe like a child looking to his father going, God, 
I trust you. You are the one that I follow after. No one looking around, every eye closed. If you want to make this decision for the first time or you want to know that you know that you know that you are saved and on your way to heaven because you believe in Jesus and are choosing from this day forward to put him as the center of your life, if that's you, would you raise your hand and keep it up for me? Hands all over the room. Keep them up for a moment, please. God bless you. Can we all stand up together? I want to pray over those of you that made that decision all over the room. It's not a magical prayer. Whether you feel something at the end of it or not, I don't know. All I know is this, is you are responding not to my message, but you are responding to the tug and the pull of the voice of the Holy Spirit on your heart. There's not enough words I can say that can convince you into heaven. It is only by the kindness of God that brings you to a place of what's called repentance, where you say, God, not my will, but yours be done. Every, let me pray over you. Lord, I thank you for the people that have raised their hand. God, would you surround them with your love right now? Let them know, God, that, they, that you are pleased with them. And let them know that this is a homecoming. This is all things being made brand new. The the sinful, broken, formless, void, chaotic part of who we are being washed and cleaned and cleansed and us being brought into full relationship. Church, will you all say this with me? As a part of our confession, we reattach our hearts to this confession. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son, son, Jesus Christ, Christ, to live on this earth earth as an example of love, love, to die on the cross, cross, to forgive me of my sins, sins, and to be raised from the dead dead, so that I might experience life. I I love you, I I trust you, you, and I choose choose from this day forward to place you as the Lord of my life. I surrender all to you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 Come on. For those, for those of you that made that decision you're already in the middle of the great cloud of witness. This is why we're excited for you. We clap because whether you realize or not, all things have been made brand new. You have been changed according to the goodness of our Lord and our Savior. And I have more instructions for you later, but I just want to tell you this. When it talks about the cloud of witness, the word also tells us that when just one person, there was hands all over the room, but when just one person makes that decision, that all of the angels in heaven, they are rejoicing. Amen? Amen. And so we rejoice with you. We're going to end this service with a song. This is a new one, but let me remind you that this is what God has done for us. We all have been changed. Surrounded, I'm found in the kindness of your love. Awestruck in wonder, my heart is overcome. You carried the weight of all of my shame. With thorns on your head, but forgiveness in your eyes. You said it was finished. Then you gave up your life Once and for all The chains of my past are gone I'm changed, I'm changed I'm not who I used to be I'm saved, I'm raised Out of the grave that once held me
Sin away. 